We are here. Angelo Rowe is one of my very favorite attorneys. Uh, so the backstory, I always start with a little backstory of how we know all the people and uh, went against Angelo when I was a prosecutor, a very experienced defense attorney. You were doing more criminal defense at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when I went into private practice, I'll tell a story. Uh, we were down at the Ontario County Courthouse, and I was probably in, been in private practice for about a week. And Ontario County Court was a relatively intimidating place to go back then. Uh, Mike Cantillo was the DA, ruled a uh, very aggressive prosecutor. And uh, Angela says to me, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm in private practice now. He goes, okay, come with me. And he walked me around the entire courthouse and said, friend of mine, Robert King, he's uh, one of the good guys. And I was always good in Ontario County after uh, that introduction. So thank you very much. Sure. Uh, and as we got into more injury practice, Angelo also has a great injury practice himself. And he was uh, on my speed dial when we started out. And we've, we've teamed up on some cases. We've worked together, uh, spent time together socially, but uh, a fabulous attorney. Can't wait to talk to you about all of your experiences, how you got here, and, and really a really great person and we're going to talk about some of your other stuff you're doing besides lawyering. Thanks, Bob. So tell us, tell us, uh, how'd you get here? So I've been practicing 29 years, you know, which I can't believe it's been that long, but I was lucky enough. I went to law school in Ohio um, and then came back. My father was a practicing attorney and I actually had the option to go into the Monroe County DA's office uh, at that time. And I chose to work in a, in a small office that was a general practice based uh, firm with my father and at that time another attorney who's now has significant prominence in our community Joseph Tamilio was working for my dad so I really had both aspects uh, of one where my father had this broad-based practice and then Joe was much more leaning into the criminal pieces at that time and so I had two perspectives to, to build on and then we had an office in Brighton over in Lomans Plaza that shifted downtown for a few years and then in 07 I left and I started a new firm in Victor with uh, a friend of mine, Toby Ray, who grew and up in Victor was a prosecutor. And your dad, uh, Michael. Mike. Yeah, Mike. my dad's Mike. Mike, Mike Rose. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he, he represented every restaurant uh, within 100 miles, if I recall. He represented everybody. Yeah. He did. And uh, yeah, I was, I was really lucky to work with him. So, so tell us a little about, uh, you, you grew up, I, I know you went to McQuaid, but uh, what were you into as a kid and, and how did you end up becoming an attorney? Yeah, so grew up was pretty awesome. You know, being in McQuaid, uh, my dad was an Aquinas graduate, so it was kind of difficult for him to spin me over to McQuaid, but he did. He let me go. My mom kind of pushed the McQuaid thing. Um, met the people in my life in ninth grade at McQuaid who are still very much a prominent centerpieces of my life, you guys that I'm really, really close with and I'm very lucky went on to St. Lawrence University and was just kind of going through the motions, small liberal arts schools and English lit major. And I came around the time when we we're gonna figure out what we we're gonna do when we graduated. And my dad was an attorney, my grandfather on my mom's side, two of my uncles and my brother-in-law. I had a number of attorneys and I think every single one of them told me not to go to law school. So being the rebel that I was, the obvious choice was yeah, go to law the school. The obvious choice was, I figured there were, I always tell my dad, I figured you were hiding something from me. So uh, there I go and I, I, you know, take the LSATs and do okay. And my dad is a Notre Dame graduate, University of Notre Dame. He's quite a story coming from the West Side and nothing to, to go there and go to law school. So we were born and bred and my family to go to Notre Dame. And I applied thinking, you know, it was kind of a long shot. I was waitlisted, but uh, went to a smaller school in Ohio Capital University, which actually a number of lawyers and judges have gone to locally. Joe D'Amelio actually went there, uh, Vince D'Analfo, uh, Dan Arelli, who's now passed away. And there's been a few others around. It's a great little litigation school, but the irony is I got into Notre Dame after being in uh, Columbus for two weeks and uh, called a buddy of mine who's a double domer. He did undergrad and he was in law school, and I asked him what he was studying, and Never forget, he goes, oh, Butch, he goes, you're a pretty smart guy. He goes, but you'll fail out with him. <laughs> 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 Meaning you'll never catch up yeah. because, yeah. you know, you know, the, the first, they, they right. read you out. And so I, uh, I was going to transfer my second year. But by that point, I fell in love with Columbus and a lot of things I was doing there. So I stayed in law school there. And so we talked a little before we started, but uh, every lawyer has a case. Yeah. Every every lawyer has a case. This is your <laughs> idea. So, yeah, I know. so I tell know. us tell us your case. You know, there, there's a few when we talked about that just a little bit this morning that I thought of that, that come to mind. But, but I truly think one of my favorite 
uh, pieces of law is not a criminal case, although there's some great cases that I want very proud of those. But I, um, I think it was in 2015 or so, I had a, a civil case in which uh, I had a guy who was uh, injured, worked for the New York State Department of Transportation, but there was a third party involved, worked for Sealand, and he was injured uh, trying to correct the mistake that Sealand had created on the job and almost lost his leg. So we, you know, we began a suit because there was no settlement offer. It was always zero. Um, I actually lost summary judgment. And we were thrown out of court for not having a cause of action. Uh, we appealed that, won a 5-0 reversal. Bled a lot of money out of my pocket because my client didn't have any. And he's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Really became like family to me. And we proceeded to trial, I think it was December of 16, in Ontario County. And it was kind of a neat thing because uh, you'll relate to this. Uh, the lawyers, I was dealing with lawyers from out of, uh, out of the Rochester area mostly. But there was one particularly really good lawyer who was involved, and she was heading up the defense the first day I showed up. There was one lawyer there. And I think they were going to steamroll kind of the country bumpkin lawyer, and I, I like to play that up a little bit too. <laughs> they have no idea what my background is. Oh, <laughs> just a and poor country lawyer. Poor country I've never lawyer. said that. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, I, don't, I, don't know I think doing. I've heard that before. <laughs> so the, se- the second day, two lawyers were there. The third day, three lawyers were there. And I think by the end of the trial, I think it was four lawyers against me. And... Um, it was neat because there was never an offer in this case. And um, ultimately what ended up happening is uh, we got a verdict and it ended up being the second highest verdict in the history of Ontario County and still is. So wow. uh, very proud. And, and I, you know, I, I'm an emotional, sensitive guy. You know, Bob, you know this. <laughs> but, uh, you know, really, it was one, I've never been in tears in court. And that was the, when they read the verdict, my client and I broke down because he had been through hell. I mean, the poor guy had had seven, eight surgeries. Just a wonderful, powerful, kind man, good dad. And this had ruined his life, and he wasn't going to get anything. You know, we kind of overcame every obstacle. And I always think about how many times he could have quit, you know, and uh, we did a good job for him. So I was very, very happy. Did you use it in the summation? What's that? I've been beating these guys so bad for four days that the next thing you know, they're going to bring a bus of lawyers in here. No, no, but it was it was pretty interesting for me. But it was it was it was a great feeling to know that they kept having to tee up more lawyers against just the little country lawyer. Yeah, that's they that's learned good. their lesson. I don't know. <laughs> what, I, I see your list there, Bree. Wanted to uh, ask. Well, ask you, Butch, some of your yeah. We call me Angelo. We call him Bush. He's you can the call same me either guy. one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can do so. You were talking about law school. What do you? What is some advice that you would give current law students? You know, a, a lot of times you ask practicing lawyers when they have, you know, they're going to say, "Oh, my kids never go to law school." You know, because I think the ins and outs of the grind sometimes can get to us. Seems like there's a lot of psychology that is involved with being a lawyer. My personal opinion is, it's one of the best degrees that you can ever get. So my advice would be, if you have an interest in pursuing the law, dig into it. I think that. The most beneficial thing you could do is probably call, if you know anybody in the law, or just call a bar association and say, I'd like to shadow someone for a day or a week. I know lawyers who would do that in a heartbeat. I've done it. I know Bob's probably done it and many other lawyers. My advice would be go seek out somebody who's doing it and spend some time with them and, and ask the questions that you have and find out really what it's about. The degree is spectacular. The degree makes us think differently, right. makes you process things differently. The practice of law, there's a million things that you can do with a law degree. It's a great degree, but it's hard. Okay. Nothing easy about it, and so I'd say find out what it's about. So you say somebody is interested in being a lawyer. You have law students now, and mm-hmm. they want to be, you know, they want to be a good lawyer. They want to go out and and help people. Mm-hmm. What what do you tell those? How do you get from having a law degree to being able to go help a guy change a change a person's life, like you described? Right. Or there, find your a, niche. Yeah, almost. I think the only way you do that is experience. So a lot of times, what I tell you know, I've spoken to classes and before, like what you're asking, I say. If you're truly interested in this, you have to go find a mentor. You have to go find somebody that's going to tell you what the ins and outs are. Also try and experience what, what it is on a day-to-day uh, existence to wake up and be a lawyer and the responsibilities of that. I don't think there's any movie, any book that you can point to other than experience. And one of the things that law school, I think, doesn't give us is the idea of mentorship, of really having someone in the community where you want to practice that's going to help you out those first six to eight months. Yeah, and I think that's in any career or profession, right? And, and sure. if you care about your craft, you hear these stories about Kobe Bryant reaching out to Michael Jordan at 3 in the morning. Like, how do you hit that spin? Whatever whatever your craft is. The, uh, sure. and, and I think 
you know, I appreciate our friendship so much because you've helped me a lot. And, and I know Joe D'Amelio, he, he one of the very best lawyers, best, best lawyers anywhere. This guy is incredible. Yeah. Uh, and so, so tell, yeah. you, you go in with your dad, but Joe is how much older? He's a little older so than So Joe's you? probably 10 years above me, maybe okay. nine years above me. And Joe had gone to Capitol. That's actually how I wound up at Capitol. Um, Joe was a, working for my dad when I applied to schools, and he said, go apply to that one. It's good, and I'm glad I went. But Joe uh, gave me... So he was already, at that point, he's, I mean, I think Joe's done 100 murder trials Yeah, now. Joe, Joe was at just that point, kicking he, off into the real hard, heavy-duty criminal defense practice and making a name for himself right when I got out of law school. So he's just, he wasn't where he is now. He was just climbing that ladder. He's probably mid, mid-30s yeah. and just grinding. Early th- yeah, mid-30s. And so, and we were like family, but... Um, I remember, you know, every lawyer has their own kind of trick of the trade, what we do. But Joe gave me the best piece of advice. And I'll share this with law students while they're in law school or if you go out and practice law. And I think I'm one of my first trials coming up, probably a misdemeanor criminal trial in city court, you know. And when we were a young lawyer, those seemed like the biggest, heaviest things on the planet. And I think Joe gave me the best piece of advice that I ever had. And um, he was helping me prepare. And I was probably getting overwhelmed or confused about something. He said, don't worry about that. He said, the key is you never let anybody outwork you. You outwork whomever you're going against. If you're up later, if you're researching harder, you never let anyone outwork you, and you're always going to do fine. And it was the best piece of advice for a young lawyer that, that I was that was probably a little scared, a little intimidated going into city court and county court, not knowing what I was doing. And uh, I think it was wonderful to have Joe there, along with my dad, who had really been an established lawyer in the community for a long time. And you have a great relationship with a lot of lawyers and judges, and that, I think, I is your personality. And in some ways, I think we have similar personality traits sometimes where you're able to ask for help. It's like, <laughs> people don't ask for help. They don't do it. You, yeah. If you need help and you ask people honestly and humbly, they will generally help you. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly, Bob. Um, you know, I think as, as lawyers have this kind of personality trait anyway, where I think there's some bit of ego that follows you through law school or you develop it. And if you can keep that in check and be humble, and when you don't know something, instead of being the loudest voice in the room, be the smartest voice in the room. Be the one that will ask for help. Be the one, and I agree with you. It's key. What else you got, Brie? All right. <laughs> well, I'm moving out of the law area All conversation right. yeah. because I hear you have a second career, and that's mm. music. So mm-hmm. how do you go from being a lawyer to then going on stage and performing music. And, and, tell, and how did you who, get there? Who's your band? And tell us about your <laughs> yeah. albums and all that stuff. Okay, so my band is a little different. So I have a, a band that I play with called Good Trip, and they're great friends. We just added actually a new drummer uh, who's a lawyer. So huh. And then there's another lawyer in the band named Tom Bernacki who's one of the tip-top, tip-tip-top medical uh, malpractice defense attorneys around. Our bass player is Mike Borelli, who's been a, a local uh, business person, does very high-end stuff uh, with accounting and owning businesses here. And then we have Nate Thomas. Nate was an Ontario County District Attorney with your brother yeah. for a little bit. And, and Nate is now a county, attorney, county right? attorney in Ontario. It's so like brought, a band of lawyers. Band of lawyers, yeah. almost. Poor Mike is the non-lawyer, but he, you know, he's you probably still like him. That's okay. no, all right. We've been <laughs> knowing each other since we were 15, so <laughs> he's stuck with me. Uh, you know, the, the, the music for me is um, my way of meditating out of the law a little bit. It's my break. It's always been my break from school or anything. I started playing when I was 12 years old and then kind of played and took lessons from very fortunate locally to take some really excellent musicians, but then put it away uh, for but college. you sing and, so. and then you play what instrument? So now, so uh, I sing, play guitar, play piano, play bass, I can do drums if I have to, but I'm wow. not great. So on all my almost all of my albums, other than drums, I play every instrument in every voice. So mm-hmm. people hear my albums like, well, who else is on there? I'm like, well, that's just me. Wow. So yeah, I, I have a studio. That's and impressive. It's well, uh, you haven't heard it. It could be really well, bad. So, it sounds no. impressive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's 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 going pretty well. And my first album came out in 2007, and I actually did a podcast a, a couple months ago. And I they, they want to know how I started, and I'll, I'll make it a short story. I had no idea what I was doing, um, but for a long time, I had uh, kind of disavowed my musical career. I always said, oh, I'll do it next year. I'll, I kept putting it off. Mm-hmm. And it's a great lesson in life to not do that because here I was, you know, in my mid-30s, and I hadn't done this thing that I always wanted to do. 
good friend of mine from law school got very sick. Uh, he was down in just D.C., um, Jason Cohen, and he was going to die. He had cancer, stage four. was awful. And that prompted me to say, what am I doing? And so I did my first album without knowing a thing about recording, singing, doing all that stuff that you really should know uh, within six months because I knew that there was a limited timeline. And I actually was able to get it out in uh, July of 2007, about three weeks before he passed, and he got to hear it. And that really kind of jump-started everything. And now seven albums later, my last one just came out a few weeks ago, and that's doing really, really well in the streaming world. I'm on all the... No. What's, what's the name? Uh, Put yeah. it out there. Uh, <laughs> Where do we find it? That's so yeah, the name of the album is called Datura, D-A-T-U-R-A. That's kind of a weird little night flower thing. Um, but it's streaming on everything from uh, Spotify, Pandora, YouTube, um, what Amazon. Kind of, what kind of music? So this is pretty, uh, I'd say it's probably that jammy indie kind of feel to okay. it. Um, pretty loose. But there's singer-songwriter stuff on there. I just make it more full. I put stuff on there that's pretty complex but it's simple it's hard to explain i you know i've had people try and put me in a category and music and i've done some radio like, stuff like what would i be doing when i'm playing your music i always think about it's a, <laughs> such a great question so what i think about is what do i like to drive to and what do i like to drive to if i'm driving alone okay. and i'm like going someplace and like either what makes me kind of reflect or go someplace else so it's that type of music it's, okay. it's, it's music that kind of will take you somewhere yeah and uh, I've been fortunate. I've been signed to a big label, my last album, and I chose to go back to independent for this one. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But I think one of the coolest things you can do is when you own all the rights to your music and you do it all yourself, you're not beholden to anybody else. And I, I think I'm that guy. Yeah. I don't want to be The creativity aspect is in your control. Yeah. Yeah, you can be weird or not weird, and you don't have to write in a certain way or for anybody in particular. So I, I enjoy that, and that's why I continue to do it. But there Do you is, tour like, as well and with any of the bands? So or? in 19, when I came out with the album Glisten, I was signed to this label out of New York, and I, and they wanted me to do a small tour uh, to start. And that would have been in New York, Boston, D.C., Philly. Um, and I would have had to take about six weeks off from law, which I would have loved to have done. The timing was couldn't have been worse. Oh. And I was like, I just can't do it. It was in the summer, and I was real busy. And um, so I, I, I just couldn't do it. Um, the opportunity for me has been there. I've opened for very big bands when I was a solo act in, um, yeah, in the early 2010, 12 area. I opened for some pretty big touring bands and did that solo, and that was always a little bit scary. That's when I would still be nervous. Those, those days are a little over. <laughs> well, I think it's great that you have two careers, that yeah. you can balance and, and you enjoy both. I do. I love helping people. I, I, I developed my practice around my personality. It was, Bob said some very kind things, probably too kind. But um, I think caring for people when they come to your law office and, and caring for what is happening with them matters. And there aren't enough lawyers who do that, and Bob is certainly one that does. And you know, I'm honored that he asked me to do this, but more honored to be his friend because he follows that 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 lineage of caring about people. And yeah. that's what makes the difference, right? And, you know, when you go into a doctor's office, you can always tell the doctor that cares versus the one that you're just a yeah, number. Exactly. And I, I think it's important that we don't, as professionals, ever treat people like that. And right. with, with music, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know if you want me to go down the path of Haiti and what goes yeah, on. Yeah, we're going to talk about Haiti next. Oh, okay. uh, but your music is under, it's Angelo Rose. That's it's Angelo it. Rose, yep. And I, I was going to say, do your listeners know that you're a lawyer? Like if they're playing, they're no. like, hey, I got <laughs> no. pulled over, what do I do? <laughs> no, you know, I, I, it's so funny you say it. So there's been plenty of times when I've been out there with my band and my band's great and we're gonna do an album this winter and we're gonna do uh, we're gonna do one together and I can't wait. But, but I've been up on stage before and you can see people come in. I see a client walk in the door and they're staring at me and they're pointing with their friends and they have no idea. And, yeah. like, and I can hear them mouthing the words, I think that's my lawyer. Like, I think uh, he was in court I with me. I think that's my lawyer. <laughs> And they'll kind of creep their way up to stage on a break, and they're like, "It is you." And like, huh. "What is this?" I'm like, "Ah, it's and my brother." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a whole other part of me. You, you got a show. I know you got a show coming up in December. Yeah, well, it's great. Well, the band's been off for about a year, and we're coming back strong. We're playing on December second. We're playing at the Cottage Hotel in Menden, which is kind of a home bar for us. Home, oh. uh, it's a great little spot, mm -hmm. and it's like a seven o'clock start. And then I'm very excited because we're playing. Uh, at Abilene, uh, downtown Rochester, which is probably the premier music venue for, for anybody around the area. Danny Deutsch owns it, and Danny's the best. Uh, really promotes music, really cares about the Rochester music scene, so it's an honor to always play for Danny. I did when I was a solo act. I was lucky that 
uh, he did that for me, and he still brings my band in. So What's we're excited. That? That's the 16th. Okay. So the December 2nd and the December 16th, we're at Abilene, and that's like a 536 o'clock start, which we like on a Friday. Get people coming out of work downtown. It's a lot of fun. Okay. I know I'm planning to go to Abilene. That's the one. Good. Uh, I want to go to the cottage one. That one sounds fun. It's fun. It's going to be a little, (laughs) they're both going to be a little rowdy because we've been off for a while. And so. So you're ready to go. We're ready to go. And it seems like, you know, I've, the the online support has been pretty strong. And so it's, we'll see. You never know who's going to show up. All right. So there's besides music Mm -hmm. and running a very successful law (laughs) office, you have a a third uh, thing that I know, I know a fair bit about, uh, very passionate about helping people in Haiti. I, yeah, yeah. And that, and that, so anything that I um, get from music, the streaming world, or even if I did a small tour, if it was just me, everything goes to this children's hospital in Haiti called St. Damien Pediatric. And it's the only children's hospital in Port-au-Prince, uh, which is the capital of Haiti. And um, so anytime I tell people, oh, if you're listening to me today, you're actually helping kids. What people don't understand is how little artists really get you know, from Spotify or from that. So I, like I said before, I own all the rights to my music, so I'm not cutting it up with anybody. But if you got on your phone and you stream me on Spotify today, the average I get per song is about eight, one thousandth of a cent. Okay. <laughs> so thank, So when I get a check for $200, mm-hmm. I'm like, holy mo, and that goes to hate, whatever. So when I've had good periods, I'm like, wow, people are really listening to the yeah. music because it's so vastly little. And it's that's a whole other subject we could talk about someday about how music is being just devalued, which is horrible. But people don't know that. You know? Yeah, people don't know that. I've heard about that. Yep. But yeah, we can have you back on for a whole episode <laughs> about that. <laughs> yeah, no. And so, uh, so to raise money for Haiti, I have to come up with creative ideas back in uh, I went there in 2017 and was able to visit the hospital. I started this whole process in 2010 um, just by chance. One of my best friend's moms had an affiliation to this, uh, what I believed was an orphanage, and it is an orphanage. But I never, um, I never really knew that much about it. And then the earthquake happened in 2010 uh, by chance a few weeks after that, and I was actually a month or so. I wrote a song and wanted to give it to to this hospital and so I learned a lot about St. Damien and the company called MPH or not the company, the, the charity. It's Nuestros Pequeños Hermanos, which is a big company throughout the world, but specifically St. Damien was the one I wanted to help in Haiti. So wrote a song in 2010 that, that back when CDs were still a thing and my buddy was uh, actually Mike Brelli, the bass player in my band, was still a part of Brugger's Bagels and got me in all the Brugger's in New York. And every CD we had sold out within a couple of days. So we raised a bunch of money. So I got on their radar. And then from then on, I just tried to create interesting ways to raise money for them. Um, and when I went to Haiti in 2017, I met a really great guy named Will Ag, And he was scouting a, a film there. He was a young guy who went to Stanford. And he ended up shooting a film there. And in 2018, we did the world premiere here at The Little. And then my band played. And just that little event we raised well over $100,000 with the Rochester there. community. I was Bob there, was there that night. It was, uh, it was pretty spectacular. Yeah, and the, uh, the film is great. It's still out there, and he's a great, we've become good friends. He gave a talk, too, if I recall. Yeah, he, he uh, talked at the theater. He came in, uh, the director came in and talked about making the movie, which was really cool to hear his perspective as the director. It was, and being a part of that, just on the shirt tail, just be, knowing Will and his heart always being in the right place, including what he's doing now, um, you're going to read a lot about him down the road What's as a the, filmmaker. So, so uh, Haiti, though, if people want to look at the Haiti stuff. So where, where to, I have a website that, that uh, will direct you to all the right places. The website that I have is HadesRain.org. And then if you go to my website, it kind of gives a little bit of a detail. And there's a video that I shot about why and what they need. But what's really interesting and what people I find um, – Find, what people find interesting is there is a menu with the costs for things on there. Like if you give $1,000 for chemo treatment, if you gave $15, it will immunize three kids against this, you know, diseases that are going to kill them. So I put a big menu up there uh, so people who do want to donate can do that. And what's really cool, if you hit the Donate Now button on my website, it takes you right to the NPH site. Mm-hmm. You put in all your information, and it's a complete tax write-off because they're a 503C. So I didn't have to form my own. I utilized theirs. And so anytime anyone donates, writes a check or anything, I always make sure that it goes through it. But most people do credit cards mm-hmm. these days. That it goes through that. And that way, it definitely goes to the hospital. 
Uh, one of the things people ask me is, how do I know the money's getting there? Well, there's a couple of reasons I know. One, I was there. And two, the people who are affiliated with it ensure that the money that you donate, um, I, th- I think that the spend ratio versus management is one of the highest there are. I think it's, in reality, it's about 90 cents of your money actually goes there. So only 10 cents on a dollar will go towards management. Whereas if you donate to Red Cross or those things, it's the opposite. I think that Red Cross and the other ones almost all goes to management and very little will get to the people. So when these awful tragedies come, you know, and people are donating, I was like, well, be aware, do research, find out which one's giving the money. So what I'm, I love about being part of St. Damien and what I do there is that I know the money gets there and I put my hands around the benefit of what it does there. So if you believe me, if you know me, your money's going there. And that's what I love. That I can guarantee it's going there. Yeah, and I know you've worked for years and years and years raising money yourself. And I have. It, January, we were wanting to go on a fishing trip to Guatemala, and you're doing a fundraiser. Yeah. Uh, I can't go fishing with you, Bob. I know. So I'm hoping that in January, I may be doing a little bit of traveling, and I, I, I'm waiting to hear back because there's been some discussions of me being part of a bigger event with uh, – St. Damien and MPH, where I can have the opportunity maybe to be playing with other well-known musicians and hopefully doing something that we can raise a significant amount of money. If that doesn't happen, what's going to happen here in uh, in Rochester is that we're going to be doing something in probably late winter or spring where I'll be holding a larger event, and we're going to do some something like that. Where can people keep up to date on what's going on? So that's such a good question. I have a website that's different. That's just angelorose.com. Mm-hmm. So that's my personal music site, okay. and I do update on there. Um, just redid it, so that's coming forth. Uh, Facebook is pretty good. I do have Instagram. It's under Angelo Rose Music. I never my label signed me up for that, but now okay. I'm starting to build there. And then uh, Facebook, just me. I don't have a band site anymore because okay. I was hocked, hacked off in November, and somebody oh, no. from China stole my identity for Yikes. a while. And Facebook didn't want to help me get it back. So <laughs> if you look me up on Facebook, I'm usually pretty good at responding if you have questions. And I, I, most of what I put on Facebook is just about Haiti or music. I don't, I'm, I'm not really a big And Instagram person. too? IG, yeah. Okay. Angelo Rose Music on Instagram. Yep. What about TikTok? I'm not on TikTok nor Snapchat. I'm sorry. Are you? <laughs> You're going to promote me? Are you going to promote me on TikTok? Yeah, not a problem. But I really feel like you need a TikTok because you can be the singing lawyer. Like you can give (laughs) legal advice as you sing. (laughs) I'm sorry. Or you and Bob can tag team. You can be on uh, Bob's TikTok. You want to do your first TikTok song right now? Yeah. Yeah, If I brought my guitar, we could have done our first right here. That would have been there, great. <laughs> there was this cat when I got to law school. I heard about this dude in Philadelphia. I kid you not. A friend, a friend of mine went to law school with him. He was a lawyer in Philly, hated it. So one day he quit and he bought a food truck and he sold hot dogs out of his food truck by the courthouse and he called them law dogs. And for $10, you got one legal question and someone's going to steal this. You know someone's going to take this right now. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> law, and you know what? The lines are around the corner. He made a gazillion dollars. He was law dogs. He sold like 10 bucks. For a one legal question and a hot dog. That is. <laughs> value meal. Wow. <laughs> and a Coke. A value meal. <laughs> we got to come up with our own version of that, yeah. Bob, right? right? So, yeah, maybe the singing lawyer. I don't well, know. We'll see I'm what we can I'm just saying do. TikTok might be might a be the way thing. for you to take off. <laughs> yeah. I would, if I had a little bit more time, I would, trust me, I'd be, I'm, I'm the worst self-promoter there is, so I have to be better at it. Um, but I'm lucky that I have good friends and some some friends in the music business that you put that push me out. You can just be on Bob's TikTok. But, I didn't even know Bob guests. had a TikTok. Oh yeah. my gosh, you should oh, you yeah. should see it. You're going to be on the TikTok, King Law Attorneys. Wow. All right, maybe I'll sign up. Maybe you'll convince me. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, so what's in the works besides everything we've already talked about? What's uh, What's your next 12 months look like? So the next 12 months, a um, couple big cases I think that you know about. I've, I've just couple really difficult pieces of civil litigation that I can't really get into detail because they're mid litigation mm-hmm. um, but they're heavy and they're they're very heavy for a solo practitioner to have and I know you, you could appreciate that for what you do too and so it'll be a lot of that trying to work through the, the quagmire of that on the music front uh, like I said I hope to, to start recording an album with my band this winter we already have the songs kind of laid out and that's it uh, you know I'm not traveling I don't uh, have any plans <laughs> yeah, for the, the local folks, uh, which on Main Street and Victor, it's a red, a really yeah, historic, so cool red building. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, my law firm is called actually Finger Lakes Legal. 
I did that unoriginal name a few years ago. Now it's stuck to me. And yeah, it's just a red building. It's actually the oldest building in Victor. We figured out, I think it was built in 1837. And it's been everything from a wagon shop to a funeral home to a hotel. And according to a client of mine a few years ago who was a medium, uh, it's haunted. I was uh, just going to ask you if it's haunted. <laughs> so we have three people who apparently live upstairs. Uh, one is the original owner, William Seavey. Uh, he was the original wagon owner. Then she didn't know who the other two people, but they hang out. And they're non-threatening, apparently, and they just like to hang out. And, uh, and, and I'm, not, I'm not sure where I fall on this spectrum, but I know I've been there late at night. Yeah. And it's a small old office, and above me, you know, there's yeah. rooms. There's no doubt you hear some things moving around up there. You're like, I don't know. Well, all these buildings are old. Yeah. So you never know what's what's around. No, you don't know what's around. <laughs> My God, just walking down your hallway today, I'm pretty sure I saw like eight ghosts. I could name the lawyers I saw back there. <laughs> there's a lot of those in this building. Yeah, there's a lot of those in this building. Is right. Anything else you want to talk? Tell us what's uh, what's on your mind and no, how you, I, how you want to leave it. I no, I appreciate it. You know, I know it's a, a, a law based podcast, and hopefully we covered enough of that. You know, the pieces of that. I still think it's a great profession. And I, and I think that as long as you build whatever you do in this profession around who you are, don't let anyone tell you how to be as a person. Yeah, be it, true to yourself. I, would, I think it's a great way to end it. And it's really interesting. We, we all have this one. I think this is about our 20th uh, person that okay. we've had in. And we all have this one thing in common. And it's like that's in the middle. And then there's all the <laughs> things coming off of that. And... The things we have in common and then the differences that make it interesting and i think where we are where we kind of came up through the law has been a great place it's it's you go to other areas of the country and they don't have what we have here and uh, i think it makes us better lawyers and really enjoy enjoy it more at least for me that's my my opinion i agree bob you know we have a great legal community here i was lucky when i got out it was still a strong legal community and you always had the older lawyers that you went to either quietly because you didn't know what you don't want to be embarrassed. But, you know, you, you go and ask those questions. And I think that you're doing that now with younger lawyers. And I know I've, I've been lucky enough to mentor a few people who come to me and ask questions and make it a family. And that way we all look out for each other. You know, I think the golden era of practicing law, according to my dad, has been doing it for 60 years, was a time when all the lawyers looked out for each other. There wasn't a competitive nature about stealing cases. There wasn't a competitive nature about throwing another guy under a bus. It was protecting each other, trying to help each other. And if we can somehow blossom that idea back into our community now, uh, and I think guys like you are doing it. There's a few other young guys who I, who I really admire, and I love the way you're practicing. Thanks so much. Thanks Bush. for Thank coming you. on. Thanks for having me.